Most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thank you very much. Brother and sister combination. Autumn's about to change her name here in a couple months. Exciting stuff. Um, if you want to be cool, be on a clean team. All the cool kids are on clean teams. Paul Marisol, I'll raise your hand back there. Um, if you're not on a clean team and you want to be cool, see Paul and Marisol. <laughs> and um, get on a clean team. And uh, what would be the schedule? Probably once every six weeks or so? Something like that. One, once every other month. We get the clean teams where they need to be. Probably about once every other month you'd be on a clean team. It takes you, it depends on how fast you can uh, move, but it takes you probably, yes, sir? Uh, it's almost like once every six weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Once a year, <laughs> right? And so it probably take you a good solid two hours up here at church, serving the Lord, uh, washing the saints' feet. And uh, I, I am on a clean team. I enjoy it. Um, vacuum. I have my headphones on, and just uh, you know, up here doing something for the Lord. Uh, and it's very simple. Anybody can do it. Uh, Mark chapter number 7. The Gospel of Mark chapter number 7. We're in a series through the Gospel of Mark. Very excited about this section this morning. At the beginning of the week, looking at it, studying it, I thought, good night. Uh, but then um, towards the end of the week, I thought, good night. I'm not going to be able to fit it all in one message. So um, it's a good portion of Scripture. And we are going to do verses 1 through 13 this morning. Uh, but really this section continues on to verse number 19. We'll look at the theme uh, once again, Lord willing, uh, next Sunday as well. And um, the title of the sermon this morning is Twisted Traditions. And we'll see that established religion of Christ's time was diametrically and diabolically opposed to Christ. And we're going to look at some of the error, error of the traditions, the religious traditions of Christ's day. And um, Mark chapter number 7. So when you find your place there, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read uh, from verse 1 down through verse number 13. Mark 7, verse number 1. It says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. 
So if you remember that Jesus is in, once again, in the land of Gadarenes. This is about 100 miles from Jerusalem. Um, so there is scribes and Pharisees coming up uh, to observe Jesus, and it's not for good reasons. It's actually to find fault with the Lord. And so they're making a pilgrimage to Jesus to find fault with him from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashing hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not thou are thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? He, Jesus, answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah, or Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. Whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, a gift dedicated to the temple, uh, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do, or do ye. And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, pray with me as I lead us, and let's ask God for a blessing from the Word this morning. So let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be here together today. And Lord, we thank you for the precious, holy Word of God. Without it, we would be lost, and we would be blind, and our religion, our religion would be empty and vain, and we would not know the God whom we worship. So we thank you for revealing yourself and your will through uh, the Holy Word of God. Lord, we pray that you would uh, just uh, bless us and guide us as we look into Scripture. I pray that you would help us to take heed to it. Lord, I pray that you help us to cleave to the Word of God, help us to have understanding minds and willing hearts, surrendered hearts to the Word of God. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us not to see others in this text this morning, but that we would see ourselves and see, see our own ability to err And Lord, I pray that we'd examine our heart. We understand from the Word of God this morning that is what you are after, our hearts. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So I have to clarify right out of the box, because I know you ladies read this and said, those disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. My, uh, My son Timmy, holy cleaves to that tradition right there. He won't even shower unless you tell him to. And then when you shower, you better tell him to use soap, okay? (laughs) Wash your hair, too, when you're... Wash behind your ears. Um, And so this portion of Scripture does not have to do with hygiene, you know? It has to do with ceremonial washing and ceremonial cleansing. One of my favorite jokes during COVID is uh, I say, well, I I inoculate myself to, to germs, what we do is have handshaking time at church, and I shake everybody's hands. Then after we're done, <laughs> and I'm inoculated against all of your germs. Um, but once again, when we're talking about washing here, we're talking about ceremonial, religious rite taught by the Pharisees. And it, uh, this religious rite, we'll see, 
really messed them up and they departed from the word of God so they could keep their ceremonial tradition. They left off the word of God to keep religious ceremony, religious rite, religious tradition. Uh, the word Pharisee means separated ones. And you read about their history. They started uh, in the book of Ezra. Ezra the scribe taught the word of God and gave the people the meaning. And um, during the time of Ezra, there were certain people groups that wanted to keep separate from the Gentile nations which were surrounding them and be a holy people unto, the God, unto God. And these Pharisees, if you read about them, they started with good cause, they started with good purpose, uh, but had corrupted themselves and actually apostatized from the true faith so that when the Messiah came, the living, breathing Word, the Word incarnate, the Word in the flesh, the Word who they said that they loved was there amongst them, dwelling among them, and they hated the word. And they persecuted him. And then finally, ultimately, um, they put him on a cross thinking that they were doing God a favor. And so beware of the leaven of the, the Pharisees. Look at your insert and read it later. Not right now. And uh, the Lord warned his disciples. These were his disciples. Uh, there's three different kinds of leavens in the Bible. We're only going to talk about one of them this morning. And this is the leaven of Pharisaism, uh, which is hypocrisy. It's playing religion. Okay? Uh, and we would call this a religious legalism. Then you have the, 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 um, the leaven of the Sadducees, which would be religious liberalism. And then you have the leaven of Herod, which would be worldliness. Okay? Uh, but Christ looks at his disciples and said to his twelve... Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And so if he warned his disciples that they could become Pharisaical in their spirit, in their nature, I can assure you this morning that you and I are tempted in our flesh to be the same way as the Pharisees. Okay? So beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Um, traditions. Let me give you Noah Webster's definition because we're going to go over the word tradition. is mentioned very many times here in our text. Uh, in tradition, the delivery of opinions, doctrines, practices, rites, and customs from father to son or from ancestor to posterity, uh, the transmission of opinions or practice from forefathers to descendants by oral communication uh, with uh, or without written memorials. Thus, children derive their vernacular language chiefly from tradition. Most of our, earth, our early notions are received by tradition from our parents. So every family, every culture, tribe, or nation, and then also every religious practice is going to have a tradition that is handed down from one generation to another. It's your way of doing things, okay? How you celebrate the holidays, uh, what time you go to bed, what you eat for dinner, or perhaps your uh, ethnic origin. And, and some ethnic origins are stronger than others. Uh, you know, I see this in the military. We had people from all over the world. Uh, man, Islanders are very, very tight-knit people, man. They don't give up their group. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite uh, authors, he writes a lot of biographies, is Eric Metaxas. His mother came from Germany, and uh, his father came from Greece. So he said, of course, I was raised Greek. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> Greek is a stronger culture uh, than Germans. I mean, my grandmother was German, uh, and by the time she died, she didn't speak a lick of German, uh, even though she came here at 12 not knowing any English. It gave up her culture. Uh, but some cultures are stronger than another, and they hand down this form that you practice a family tradition within that form. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you can follow the tradition. Let me give you an example. Um, so a mother is teaching a daughter how to cook ham. Uh, and she says, mom says to the daughter, to cook a ham, you have to cut both ends of the ham off. So why? And this, this is always a problem, you know, when you question tradition. Don't question tradition. Okay, why do you cut hams off at both ends in order to be able to cook it? Um, and mom says, you know what, I don't know why, but that's how your grandmother always taught me or always told me. And uh, let's call grandma up and see why she cut both ends of the ham off uh, to cook ham. And so they call grandma up 
and said, Grandma, why did you cut both ends of the ham off to cook ham? She said, well, at the time, my pan would not fit a whole ham in there, so I had to cut both ends of the ham off. And so you see, sometimes traditions can be handed down and practice and have lost the original meaning or the, relig- or, or the original purpose. So traditional cutting of ham at both ends was expedient for the time, but it lost its meaning over time. And uh, so here you have, in our portion of Scripture, uh, you have a hand-washing tradition. And I'm going to read you two verses here in just a, a minute. Um, from Leviticus, who was, it was written to the Levites, one tribe of Israel. And there's only two verses in the Bible that you could find about ceremonial hand washing. Two verses, okay? But by the time of Christ, um, there would have been 55 pages in the Mishnah and three chapters in the Talmud just on the matter of how you are supposed to wash your hands. So those two verses were used as a launching pad for a religious rite and for a religious ceremony uh, that was uh, systematically taught to the people. And one of the things that you would learn in the time of Christ is how to wash your hands when you go to market. Um, Here's what Edersheim says about uh, this hand washing. I won't read you all 55 pages of the Mishnah this morning, praise God, right? Or the three chapters in the Talmud. Uh, But here's a little summary from Alfred Edersheim. He said, The ceremonial washing prescribed by rabbinic praxis involves several steps. First, water was poured from a jar onto both hands with the fingers pointing up so that the water would run off at the wrist. Then the water again was poured over the hands with the fingers pointing down. Finally, each hand was rubbed with with the fist of the other hand. Strict Jews would follow these regulations before every meal and between each course in the meal. And uh, you read a little bit more about this, and the, the way and the style in which they wash their hands would have done nothing for your hygiene. So your hands aren't even getting clean. They're just going through this ceremonial religious rite, uh, thereby being religious. And, and so the religion of the day had become twisted by tradition. And the first thing we see about the, tr- the twisted tradition, point number one here, uh, twisted traditions find fault with Christ's disciples. And so when they saw Christ's disciples, they pointed at Christ's disciples as being ceremonial, ceremonially defiled, that these disciples were defiled because they did not keep the tradition of that day and age. And so they could not have communication with God because they did not wash their hands before they ate. They were defiled. So look at verse number one. Then came together unto him Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. Um, So here's what the Pharisees are missing out on. Uh, And we've been through this last chapter. uh, The Lord Jesus showed that he was greater than Moses, and he performed a work of recreation or a work of creation when he said, when he fed 5,000 besides women and children, perhaps 20,000 people with the bread, that he has a power to create life and life everlasting. Uh, And then not only that, he has control over the chaos of sin, pictured by that sea, Uh, picturing the scary circumstances and the trials uh, that we have in this life, uh, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, in that, remember that Christ walks out on the water, that, that all the circumstances of life are under his feet. And so Moses, you know, fed us bread in the wilderness. Actually, our father did. Moses led the children of Israel through the Red Sea, a wall of water on their right hand, a wall of water on their left, that God has control over your circumstances. And remember, when these disciples get to the other side, and by the way, he ministered to them, Jesus ministered to his disciples in the middle of the storm. He didn't say peace be still until he dealt with them a little bit out there on the boat. And remember, Peter stepped out when the wind and the waves were rocking, man. And he expects you to exercise faith in the midst of the storm. And then he says, what have you no faith? Have faith in me. I am in control of the storm. Uh, And then they get to the other side. 
And we say that God is preparing you in the storm to meet the needs of other people. And then all these gatherings see what was done here. And they see it's Jesus. And they bring all these sick people. And they bring all these needy people down to Christ. And he is healing them. He's meeting the need of the hour. And he's preaching uh, the gospel uh, to them by which they could have not only physical healing, but they could have spiritual he- healing and live with God forever in heaven, and they could have real meaning and purpose in their life. But notice these Pharisees, they come, they're seeing all this, but their eyes are blind to it. Their hearts are hard, we're going to see, that God is going to preach, Jesus Christ is going to preach directly to their heart. And it says here that um, they came up from Jerusalem, and in verse number two, and when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defile, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands, oft eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold as washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels of tables. When the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Jesus, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with unwashed hands? Let's stop there. So they're going to ask Jesus. They, they find condemnation. Um, let me just here by way of uh, introduction to say that every church, and it, just like every family and every home, has a certain culture and has a certain tradition. Why we do the things that we do. And I think if we tune in this morning, this will help all of us who are involved in church kind of be able to frame and understand the difference between tradition and also biblical principle and how we take the biblical principle and we form our tradition in accordance with the word of God. So the word of God should be over tradition, not tradition over the word of God. So at the time that Jesus came, tradition was held over scripture and they looked at the lens through scripture. Let me tell you something. Um, Any cult out there, any false teaching, um, you know, I remember being a Jehovah's Witness's door, and I knocked on his door. How you like that? <laughs> Back at you, huh? You know why Italians don't like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? They don't like any witnesses, okay? But anyway, um, knock on his door, and, um, you know... It was amazing talking to him back and forth. I mean, very rarely does a Jehovah Witness meet a Christian who actually knows the Bible and can defend his faith a little or her faith a little bit. And so we were batting it back and forth. And, um, and uh, I, I remember, quote, I can't remember what the, the answer was, but I said, you know, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the dead of Christ shall rise. He's talking about no resurrection from the dead. And the dead of Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. He said, well, that happened in 1915. <laughs> well, that was news to me. <laughs> you know you miss the rapture, folks. It's past. Um, and I, I remember saying to him, let me challenge you something. Why don't you read the Bible n- not through the lens of the Watchtower magazine? You know what I said? You know what happened when I said that? It was like I blasphemed, and I'm getting to this in a minute, okay? Like I blasphemed the Holy Ghost or something. He could not even speak to me. We're done. That was it. Um, you'll meet Mormons, very good people, very, you know, outwardly, I mean, you know, you know, if you weren't gonna, if you weren't gonna be a Christian, you're just gonna be a religious person on this earth. You know, move to Salt Lake. I mean, they, they look nice, they dress nice, they have great cosmetic surgery out there. I mean, everything is superficial, and um, outwardly, you talk to Mormons all the time. They'll they'll tell you that they read the Bible every single day. I, you know, I'll, I'll ask them, say, do you read do you read the Bible? Oh, every day I do. Well, how can they not see the truth? It's because they look through a lens of tradition. They're looking through a lens of the Book of Mormon and the teaching of uh, the LDS church. And at the time of Christ, if you would have walked into the synagogue, you would recognize the service, okay? There would be some sort of invocation at the beginning. Uh, God, God bless you and God keep you. God cause his face to shine upon you. There would be psalm singing. There would be hymn singing. Uh, someone would read the word of God and then they would jump from the word of God and they would explain it. And how they would explain it is through the traditional 
rabbinical teachings. Okay, so they jump from the scripture. It's kind of, and you know, um, how many have ever been in a dead Orthodox Protestant congregation? Okay. If you notice during the service, a lot of times, like their creeds that they read, and the, they're not doctrinally inaccurate. Most of them are not heretical. But I mean, the service is going to be so dead and dry and crunchy as cornflakes. You know, and, um, you know, if you got saved in one of those churches, it would be on accident, right? Uh, and so, what ha- and this is exactly what is going on in Jesus' day. So we take tradition, but tradition is servant to the Word of God and the principles of the Word of God. For instance, um, our practice in faith must be born out of religious practices on biblical principles. Sunday services, New Testament met daily, but in particularly on Sunday, the Word of God was central to the service. It's supposed to be the preaching of the Word of God is the centerpiece to the service. It is the highlight. It is the pinnacle. Uh, the the uh, Bible, the Lord reigns uh, and has preeminence in His church through the teaching and through the preaching of Holy Scripture. Uh, and so the, the, the Word of God is showcased. Uh, the Bible is, we are supposed to be the pillar in the ground of the truth. What is the truth? Thy Word is truth, okay? And so the pinnacle of all of our services uh, is the Word of God. So on Sunday, we know that we're supposed to be living in the Word of God. We're supposed to be meditating in the Word of God. We're supposed to be taught the Word of God, thinking about the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You're supposed to hear it preached. You're supposed to hear it expounded. It's part of your Christian duty. It's part of your Christian service. Uh, and so uh, a church will try to acclimate its Sunday tradition according to the command of Scripture. So you might have a Sunday school. Do you know the Sunday school program really wasn't, didn't really take off to the late 1800s? Sometimes, you know, a Sunday, a Sunday school program, uh, you know, somebody who grew up in Sunday school is something that every good church they ever went to had. You know, they look, and look at a, a church's program. They don't have a Sunday school church. They don't have a Sunday school service there. That must not be a good church, right? What is it? Tradition versus what the Bible says. And so the programs and the, ser- the service times and things like that are based out of principle. Um, the, the prayer service, we know that good things only happen. We see in the book of Acts when the church got together in corporate prayer and agreed in corporate praying and had prayer meetings. So, so you know, we would have a Wednesday evening prayer meeting. We'd have an after-hours prayer meeting. Well, uh, you know, for the tent meeting this summer, we'll have a pavilion prayer meeting. We'll have uh, different prayer meetings. Why? Because we're trying to organize the church around particular uh, biblical principle. The singing, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Christian singing uh, highlights the words and the doctrinal truth. And when we come together as a congregation, we affirm biblical truth together. Um, that was something that really clicked in my brain after I was saved. I knew all the songs before I was saved, but after I got saved, you know, coming to church and, and you know, I'm singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Uh, and, uh, you know, you look around, um, you know, unbelievers ought to be able to come to the church and see people singing in their hearts to the Lord and testifying in the midst of the assembly. We see that's something that Jesus did. They, they sung a hymn as they went on the Mount of Olives. Uh, it says in Hebrews chapter number one that I will sing a hymn in the congregation of the saints. Uh, and we get together as a church and we affirm doctrinal truth through song. And so there's a song service inside of the church. Uh, the Great Commission, you know that you are given a command, that you are not exempt from it. The Bible says, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So there ought to be some elements in the church that we're going to organize an outreach program. That doesn't mean if you don't go to our outreach program that you're disobedient to the Great Commission. But it gives you an opportunity to fulfill that command. You know, you have Super Saturdays, you have door-to-door knocking. And um, let me read something to you. Yes, okay. So let me use this as an example. We're supposed to reach the lost world with the gospel. The only hope for America is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to save our nation. And so the message, the word of God, never changes. It is an eternal truth of the word of God. 
the methods, preaching, praying, singing, evangelism, they never change, but sometimes the means do. So let me explain this to you. So you read a soul winning manual from the 1950s, and, uh, you know, uh, make sure you wear a coat and a tie, because, you know, people won't take you serious unless you've got a tie on, right? And uh, particularly a white shirt and um, tie, and you go to the door, and the guy will give illustrations about how that he was knocking on such and such a street, and the, uh, the, the guy and the woman in the house said, oh, you preacher so-and-so, come on in, and sit down, have a cup of coffee, and the missus gets him a pie, and sits down, and you know he's eating a slice of pie, drinking some coffee, and he's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with this couple. Well, let me tell you something. I ain't never been invited in for coffee and pie, and I've done a whole lot of door knocking. I know, you know, back in the 50s, people made their full-time living going door-to-door because people actually listen door-to-door. Well, we live in a different day and age, don't we? People only know who their next-door neighbor is, let alone some stranger. And I sure ain't going to wear a white shirt and a tie when I'm coming around uh, the neighborhood. They're going to think I'm some sort of cult for sure coming to your, like some sort of weirdo coming to my door. And so I'm still going to go door to door, but I realize there's going to be other avenues. Uh, We've got a program coming up, uh, and you will not read this in a a 1950s manual, okay? Uh, Is that we're going to do a mass mailing, every door direct mail, and we have a gospel tract that is designed, and on the back of that gospel tract, it does say our church in little letters. It's not an advertisement really for our church. It, is, it will say our church's name on it, where our church is at. This has got further questions. Uh, scan this. It's a QR code. You know what a QR code is? No. I don't think you do. And uh, you can take it, George, and you can put your smartphone on it, and you can touch it. She'll do it. Your wife will do it. She'll show you how to do it. And it'll go, to the, it'll go to the salvation page of our website, and they can read as beautifully illustrated. And then at the end, uh, there's gonna be, there is a beautiful video, an illustrative video that is about 12 minutes long, and it further explains the gospel. You know, and we can track this. We can see how many people are actually. So 10, 15,000 north. Uh, and so you see that the message does not change, the methods do not change, but sometimes the means change as society continues along. Uh, and, and so, um, here, back to the Pharisees. They judged other people by their traditions, and particularly the tradition of the elders. Look at verse number 3 again. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not holding the tradition of the elders. What this tradition was is they called it a fence around the law. It uh, was not the law that protected to them. It was not the law uh, that protected their tradition. It was actually their tradition that protected the law. So again, Bible tradition. It wasn't the law and then tradition. That actually the tradition was to protect the law. And um, Jesus calls them. And it, okay, so it was tradition that protected the law. And here was the theory, is that we're going to keep the people as far away. And I've heard Baptist preachers say this very exact thing. I thought, you know, that philosophy has been around a long, 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 long time, okay? That I am going to keep you as far from the ditch as possible. Okay, and I'm going to have all these rules and all these regulations for you to keep. Therefore, we'll protect that biblical principle and we'll keep you away from the ditch. Um, And so, trying to think of an example. There's so many of them, I don't know which one to pick. So, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. So, I am not going to have, and I've known people that did not have a TV in their house and they were awesome family, and I've known people didn't, did have a TV, or didn't have a TV in their house, and all their kids, like, turned out terrible, okay? I'm not going to have a TV because, you know, if my kids rebel and go out and get a TV, at least they come from the ditch. And so this was, this was the theory of this day. But here's what Christ said about their tradition. He said this. He says, you are a blind leader of the blind, and he says, you both will fall into the ditch. He says, you're majoring on the minors and not uh, majoring on the majors. And, um, and so 
here, here we go. Leviticus 22, 6 and 7. Here's the best verses in the whole Bible that they would point to and say, here's ceremonial washing. Leviticus 22, 6 and 7. The soul which hath touched any such shall be unclean until the even, and shall not eat of the holy things unless he wash his flesh with water. And when the sun is down, he shall be clean and shall afterward eat the holy things because it is his food. Period. 55 pages in the Mishnah, three chapters in the Talmud, all about how to wash your hands. Here's another thing I wanted to mention this morning. Most of the Bible is principles. Okay? So you have in the Bible the thou shalt and the thou shalt not. These are non negotiables. And then you have biblical principle. Yeah, the principle of identifying with Christ, and I'm supposed to be like Christ, and I'm supposed to identify with him. You had the principle of separation. The Pharisees were really big on this principle. The, the, the idea of we're not supposed to be of the world, we're not supposed to be conformed to the world's image, that we are supposed to be separated from the world unto Christ. So you had the principles of identity, modesty, separation, and all these different things. But they took the principle and majored on that principle. So they took the matter of purification, and um, they took it to the nth degree. So they'd, they'd, uh, Levi goes down to the market. He touches something down at the market. And he knows that a Gentile, perhaps at some time, at some point, had touched that very same table or that very same utensil. And so he comes back to his abode, and he washes and washes and washes. And it says, look at, uh, look at verse number 4. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be, which they have received to hold as washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. And this was all according to tradition. This was all according to prescription. And Levi washes and washes and washes and washes. And everyone says, look at how holy Levi is. I mean, he just does nothing but wash and wash and wash and wash and wash and wash and wash. Look at verse number 17. Um, I'm sorry. Look at, um, look at verse number 14. And here's going to be next week, but we'll uh, talk about this next week. And uh, when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you. Understand, there is nothing from without a man that can enter into him, that can defile him, but those things which come out of him, those are they that defile a man. Um, so he's going to talk about, here's where all, all, here's all murdery, murder, adultery, fornication, all these things, they come from within. He's going to say, they come from your heart. And so they're worried about washing the outside. He says, what God is interested is you having a clean heart before God. Um, the, the Pharisees started their tradition. They started their custom back at the time of Ezra. And some of you know this, but Ezra was commissioned to come back and rebuild the temple. And the temple was the place of worship. And so Ezra established a temple. Uh, Ezra the scribe, they would read the law of God, and then they would give to the people the meaning of the word of God, meaning they read a portion of scripture, and then they would explain. The scribes would go forth and explain to the people, here's what God is saying in his word. Do you understand what God is saying to you in his word? And they'd point them right there to, to, to chapter and verse. And it's the same thing that goes on today inside the household of faith. If you're in a good church, uh, you know, I heard someone say this expression, it was a good expression, uh, go to a church not that is close to you, but that is close to the Bible, as close to the Bible as possible. Uh, and so you should be able to look down on the page and say, yes, this is indeed is what God is saying in his word. It's not opinion. Um, it's not philosophy. And it's definitely not some sort of tradition passed down by some grand monkey muck way up some archbishop somewhere passed down that, no, this is what God is saying in the word of God. So Ezra established worship. And then Nehemiah comes along and he builds a wall around 
the temple. So there's no, there's no reason to build a wall unless you got something to protect inside of that wall. The only reason why you are to practice separation from the world is so that you can have pure worship unto God. You know what Jesus called the Pharisees? Whited sepulchers. They cleaned the wall, and he says, but inside there is no worship. You are full of dead man's bones. Um, in Acts chapter number 23, Paul is brought before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. Uh, you know, he was a former Pharisee, and um, the uh, priest uh, ordered the guard to the police, the, the, um, the temple guard, to smite Paul, and it was against the law. Smit him across, smit him across the face, and Paul he must have had bad eyesight because he said, I didn't know it was the high priest. He said, God smite thee, thou whited wall. You judge me according to the law and keep not the law yourself. And so here's what the Pharisees were good at, having a clean exterior. And they majored on the externals. And um, so the Pharisees were hyper-concerned about outward purification. Okay? Disciples should be Aware of confusing our outward don'ts for inward spirituality. Note, doing certain things can only protect spirituality, but cannot create spirituality. So, Abe and, Abe and Autumn are getting married. Do you know that, um, you know that when you get married is a big negative? You know what you say in your vows? Forsaking all others. Abe, you're going to be forsaking like three billion other women in the world. You sure you want to do that? Oh, he does. He does. You know, because there's a big positive. There's something to protect within those walls. Uh, and then, you know, if you're in a marriage relationship, you have rules to protect your relationship. I mean, just uh, like knuckle, you know, knucklehead easy things. You're not going to correspond with other women who are not your wife. You're not going to go out to eat with another woman. Well, because you, you are having a big don't because you have a do on the inside. And, um, and so the Pharisees got the rules confused with the relationship. They thought they had a good relationship with God because they obeyed all these man-made rules where the rules were just put there by tradition to protect the relationship that is inside. You and I have all known marriages that have blown apart. Boom! And say, I can't believe this was going on. I mean, we were going through, we were going through the motions and he'd tell me every day that he loved me and kissed me on the lips. And blah, blah. You know what he was going? Going through the rules, but the relationship on the inside was absolutely dead and gone. And um, so the Pharisees emphasize the traditions, rules over relationships instead of relationship over the rules. There's church traditions, church traditions. Um, again, principles of assembly. Uh, so much the more as you see the day approaching, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Service times, service styles, styles. Um, it's funny, the altar call was not uh, established in the mid-1800s uh, by a man by the name of Charles G. Finney. And um, from that point forward, a lot of churches have altar calls, um, inviting people to come forward uh, to get saved on altar call. Um, and I think that's a good, useful tool. We have altar call here. Uh, we allow people to come forward and pray or if they want to uh, be dealt with or whatever down at the altar. Uh, but there's no verse of Scripture that says, Thou shalt have altar calls after. Uh, you've never been in one synagogue service, even if Jesus was preaching, uh, where they'd have some sort of altar call. Uh, and so this is something that is church tradition. And how it's done is different. It's, um, I'll give you another example of, of a tradition. When we were at uh, Youth of Blaze, it was hilarious because, <clears throat> wasn't, well, to me it was hilarious. So, every, so everybody's singing, and there's a certain style of, let's call it worship. Singing is not necessarily worship. It can be part of worship. It's not worship, okay? Uh, worship is an attitude of your heart. A uh, bunch of people raising their hands, man. There was a little girl in front of us, a couple, 
a couple of rows in front of us. She was, must have been like two or a, a year and a half old. She had a bottle in one hand. She was drinking out of her baby bottle. And I tried to get her picture, and like, of course, when I pulled my camera out, that is very cute. I was going to take a picture of her, and uh, as soon as I pulled my camera out, I mean, she didn't see me. She just like went down and did, you know, a little year and a half year old thing, didn't do it again, but I just love that, man. <laughs> Adriana says to me, I dare you to raise your hand up. I said, nope. You know what? I've got different preferences. I can tell you why I have my preferences. I don't feel like doing it. Uh, our, our, um, our buddy Samson Ryman, who did the Wednesday night service, man, he was raised in an environment, man, where you go all out. I mean, you aren't having church till someone's crying, someone's weeping, someone's wailing, someone's running the aisles, someone's like losing their mind, going crazy. And uh, we had him here for Wednesday night Bible study. I love Samson, and I don't judge him for his style. And he don't judge me for my style. Why? Because it ain't in the Bible. There's two different styles, two different preferences, and God bless them both. I'm not going to say Samson's defiled, man. He ain't supposed to raise your hand. Bless God, back in the old days, you wouldn't see anybody raising their hand. Uh, you know, like whatever, man. Uh, that God has given us a Christian liberty, and God has given us biblical principles, and we can go according to those uh, biblical principles. You know, they're, they're at the altar call. I mean, they, they have a, man, I mean, an altar call. Altar call. Man, I don't do that stuff. I can tell you what's going on. I'm like way too cynical for that stuff, you know? Uh, you know, if you sing the same song over and over and over again, say this for 20 minutes straight, okay? Don't start now. Do it at home. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And say that for 20 minutes straight. And your brain will literally change neural pathways. You'll have theta and beta waves, and uh, you will change states of mind. So, you know, you have an invitation. We're singing, you know, 20 minutes, the same chorus over and over. And like, I, I know what's up. I'm not, a, I'm not a teenager, man. And even when I was a teenager, I didn't fall for that stuff. I know, what <laughs> you know, watch my watch. You know, I'm thinking, no. Uh, Preference, preference, preference. I'm not going to say you're defiled, and I don't want them to say I'm defiled because some things are preferential uh, that are handed down. There's separation styles. You know separation changes from time to time? Um, let me give you an instance. Back in Charles Spurgeon's day in the mid-1800s, um, that man smoked a cigar, man, everywhere he went. He's known for smoking a cigar. And he was like about 350 pounds on top of that. I mean, he lived to 56 years old. So, you know, if you want to live to 56 years old, just be overweight and smoke cigars. And, uh, you get and so, I mean, a world-renowned preacher smoking cigars. And uh, one day a man came up to him after a, a service and whispered in his ear. He says, uh, I'm praying that you get victory over the sin of tobacco. And uh, he announced to the church, he says, I want you to know that when I get home tonight, I'm going to take out a cigar and I'm going to light it and I'm going to smoke it to the glory of God. <laughs> and then uh, later on in his ministry, he saw an advertisement for the cigars that he liked, the cigars that Spurgeon smokes. And he said, well, I really don't think I want to be known for the brand of cigar that I smoke. And he gave up smoking cigars. Do you know that if you were a pastor in the 1950s in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, that you, when you got together for your deacons meeting, I mean, you'd, you'd have to, like, duck down to, like, see across the room because there'd just be a cloud of smoke. Guess how you paid your church's bills? Tobacco. Guess how you built that congregation? Tobacco. Tobacco. Uh, but you know, nowadays, it's probably really not a good idea, and I don't plan on it, for me to smoke. People say, 
You go to that church, and that, isn't, that, isn't that pastor smoke cigarettes? Like, in the, the whole mind changes. I mean, even the kids, like, you know, you send your kids to even public school, they're like, you know, you need to shame your parents about smoking. That's a really terrible thing. Uh, where you, again, you grew up, uh, you know, in the 1950s, you, you smoke two packs a day just in the back of your dad's car when you're riding, he's dropping you off to school, you know? Uh, there's another fellow, B.H. Carroll. He read over th- 300 books a day, one of the great Baptists of history, and uh, down in the South, smoked two packs every single day. Where I've heard, you know, guys getting up. I mean, again, some 400-pound preacher, fried chicken-eating preacher, you know, if God wanted you to smoke, he'd put a chimney on top of your head. I was like, get out of here, dude. What are we talking about? you got a book this thick. Why don't you stick to that book right there, okay? And let me tell you something. Fried chicken, you might as well just, you might as well smoke a pack of cigarettes before you eat a fried chicken. It's just as bad for you, okay? I know your body's the temple and all this stuff. And so a lot of times we can major on the minor and think that that's part of our holiness, that's part of our uh, tradition, um, I heard a pastor preaching one time. He said that he, he was preaching in a church. They had a particular pastor who uh, wanted all the women to wear hats. And he said every single woman in that church wore hats. And he says, and then that pastor moved on. He said, the next time I went to preach in that church, he said not one single woman in that whole entire congregation wore a hat. You know how, much hard, you know how hard that preacher must have worked to get hats on all the women? Mrs. Case is the only one right with God this morning. She's got on a hat. <laughs> Praise God. And, and styles change. Uh, you know, look at some of the old preachers. I mean, look, look at John Wesley, George. We I mean, did a hair down to here. You know that? It's amazing how God could still use them, even though they had. How many would vote for a president that had a ponytail? So you wouldn't vote for, for George Washington? Because he had a really nice ponytail on the back, nice ribbon on it. I got a picture in my office. You want to see it? <laughs> Styles change. My regulation is not a test of your devotion to God. So if I have a certain standard of separation in my life, I'm not to judge you by my own personal separation standard. I'm supposed to judge righteous judgment. How do I judge righteous judgment? According to the word of God. You have the thou shalts, you have the thou shalt nots, and then you have the principles for living. And here we go as far as the Bible goes and stop where the Bible stops. I was in Akron, Pennsylvania, <coughs> candidating for a church when I was 33 years old. Um, it's a big church, big congregation, beautiful building on a four-lane highway. And um, I was way too young. And I, they actually voted on me. They voted no. That was a good choice. Um, I'm, I know I would have tore that. I would have been way too, uh, I don't know, too, too young and stupid to take that. But the, the church had issues, man, issues. I remember one woman, she was a spokesman for the family, for sure. <laughs> what do you believe about divorced people teaching Sunday school class? I said, well, it depends on who the divorced person is. What are you talking about? Um, well, I don't think. My husband and I went through a lot of trouble. Again, she's speaking for, for him. He's, he's kind of cowered down like this. Um, my husband and I went through a lot of trouble, and uh, we really stuck, you know, we, we went through thick and thin and got through this marriage, and I don't think it's a good idea to have a divorced person up teaching a Sunday school class. And I remember I was 33 years old. I said, well, we probably should go as far as the Bible goes and stop where the Bible stops. Where is the scripture that thou shalt not have a divorced person teaching Sunday school class? Let me ask you that question. Again, you have precepts and principles, but I'm not going to make some sort of my personal precept equal with the word of God. And so, once again, my regulation is not a test of your devotion of God. Um, Let me ask you a question. Uh, Which is easier? Not wearing lipstick are being filled with the Holy Ghost. What's the temple? Your body. What is is the object of your Christian life? Is to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Who cares about the exteriors? You get the interior fixed, and out of the interior flows a right exterior. 
Um, what lasts for eternity? The style, the preference, or the preached word of God? So notice their accusation to Jesus. I want you to notice um, down, down here in verse number 6. I want you to look through verse number 9, and we'll probably stop right there. Um, when it says, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah the prof, prof, prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Um, here's what Isaiah says. In, now Christ here is quoting that, and he's expanding on it. By Isaiah 29, 13, it says, Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as the people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips they do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. So what people are doing is actually teaching the doctrines of men for the commandments of God. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. First Timothy chapter number 4. You ever notice when you're reading the Bible that, uh, for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord does this a lot. He would say, you, you have heard it hath been said, but I say unto you. Anytime you read in the New Testament where it says, you have heard it has been said, what they're quoting is rabbinical tradition. When a Jew quotes the word of God, they'll say, it is written. And so the people of Jesus' day, the Lord had to, a lot of times, especially, you know, you, you come in, um, you come into a true biblical preaching church, um, you have, are going to have a lot of spiritual baggage from former traditional churches that you have to disregard. And that's exactly what Jesus has to deal with in his day and age. You have heard it's been said, but I say unto you, and he quotes to them, the word of God. Uh, you have heard it's been said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say unto you, uh, uh, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you, and love, he goes into loving uh, your enemies. And, and so in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, we're going to see that what was true of Isaiah's day, he says they're teaching the precepts of men for commandments of God, uh, was true of Jesus' day, which was true of Paul's day, which is also true of our day. Um, oh, let me ask you this. How many have ever heard of a seared conscience? Here, here's how we're taught it, and I'm going to show you that it's actually wrong out of context. We get a defiled conscience and a seared conscience messed up. So a seared conscience, we're taught that like if you like look at something you're not supposed to, the first time, like, Psh, oh, oh, that burned me. That seared me. The second time you touch, it's been cauterized a little bit. And it doesn't hurt as bad. And then the third time, and then the fourth time we can touch it, and our, we are insensitive to that sin. That is true, but that's not what a seared conscience is. Seared has to do with branding, okay? You look at the first definition of seared, it has to do with branding, and it has to be, it has to, uh, it has to do with a religion conforming your conscience to their man-made teaching. Look at this right here, okay? First Timothy chapter number four. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, Remember, the Pharisees, ye are hypocrites. And we'll get into that next time we're in this text right here. Hypocrite is just, uh, it's a term for the Greek playwright. You know, how many were in drama? Two people are. Three, okay. And, you know, you got the smiley face, right? And you got the frown. And, and so what the, what the Pharisees, since they worked strictly on the external, remember that the Pharisees, they love to give, and they love to pray, and they love to fast. That's pretty good. 
to what? To be seen of men. They were putting on the dog. They were putting on a show. And so the church is a cultural center, okay? Uh, and so they were going to their cultural group, and particularly these men. Men really like cultural centers, especially if they feel like they're somebody. I, I had a friend in Oklahoma. His father was a mason, and his title was Worshipful Master. I, I was reading A.W. Tozer, and he was talking about the Masons, you know. And he said, um, he says, you know, wife's blocking the door and says, uh, the Grand Poobah is not going out tonight because I won't let him. And that's exactly what these Pharisees, they put on the wrong robes, they put on their rings, and they're coming in, hey, I'm here, let's pray. And, um, oh, man, oh, I'm, I've been fasting all day today. And uh, watch this, I'm going to give. They do all these things. They're hypocrites. And so that means that they are playing a game, an outward game, all right? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Notice this. Here's what a conscience seared with a hot iron looks like. Number three, forbidding to marry. Do we know of any mainline Christian denomination that would not allow their priests to marry? There's right there, forbidding to marry. And commanding to abstain from meats. We call that Lent. All right? And, and it says here, Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know from the... What's the next word? Where's the truth found at? The word of God. If it's not against scripture, it is okay. Um, let me explain the seared conscience, then we're done. Um, it's a fellow by the name of... Bill Grady. Wow, Bill. How many know Bill Grady? Um, he is an excellent salesman. He calls me out of the blue, and I'm like, okay, he just, he just wrote a new book because he wants to sell me some cases of it. And, he's, and I always say yes. I can't help it. He's just like, he tells me how much he loves I mean, he's got a rhythm to it, man. Tell how much he loves me, appreciates me, and remembers me when I was a kid. And remember that time when you were a teenager, blah, blah, blah. Now I wrote this book, and uh, here's what it is. And we ordered a couple cases of his latest book. His son died in a car accident two years ago. And um, he wrote this book. He said, you know, God gave his son that, so that many people might be saved. And, and God told me, he says, I took your son that many people might be saved. And he wrote a book about salvation. It's 90 pages long. And in the back of that book is John and Romans. And so we're ordering a bunch of those and we can give them to our unsaved friends. And Bill's a good writer. And, uh, you know, looking forward to giving out that book, just another long form gospel tract. So we buy a case from Bill. But he told me when he was, okay, his boss, his boss's wife, was Jill the first lady. And our president, Joe, stole Jill from his old boss. And he said, Joe, you stole the election from my favorite president, and you stole the wife of my favorite boss. That's, that's him. That's not, I didn't say it. Um, <laughs> and so he said he was selling, he was, he was selling these computer systems these typing systems, and there was this huge Christian school. It was a Baptist-run Christian school, and uh, he said that he went in there, good salesman. He sold 250 of these things, huge sale, huge. And so the guy wanted to take Scripture and lead him to salvation through the Word of God. He said, sure, I'll do that. And so he played along, and the guy went down through the Romans Road, plan of salvation, got down to the end, and he repeated the prayer. Again, he wanted to make the sale, he wasn't sincere, and uh, said the prayer, walked out the door with the check, and he says, when I got out to that parking lot, he said that I thought that hell itself was going to swallow me up. I had sinned against the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and I was in an apostate church and going through their little religious ritual, and he says, my conscience condemned me. You know what he had at that time? A seared conscience. He had been branded something, and later for him to get saved, he had to overcome that seared conscience so he could lay hold of the truth of God's word. One of the things that you are going to have to forsake in order to come to the knowledge of the truth is man-made tradition. 
Let me tell you what the Bible says. There is none righteous, no, not one. Quit polishing the outside. I know you're a good person. I know you're very religious. You're in church this morning, on a Sunday morning. I know you were brought up a certain way. I know there's one thing that the Lord cares about. You've heard it's been said, but I say unto you. Let me ask you, what's on the inside this morning? Do you have knowledge and belief in God through the holy word of God? Christ said to those Pharisees here, he said there, he says that you are defiled on the inside. He says, don't purify the outside. Purify your heart. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a religious person. Don't worry about your outward manifestation of your religion. Maybe you, you punch a clock every time you go to church. I mean, you are, you are a religious Baptist. I mean, you follow the tradition of Baptist culture. Uh, this morning you're in church doing your Baptist penance, right? You know what God cares about? You know what the heart of the matter is? Is your heart before God. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I, I pray that you would um, help us. As, uh, as Christ warned his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Lord, I pray that the, the twist of traditions that many times we hold to and we hold over the word of God, we become self-righteous, we judge other people, and we consider ourselves righteous because of them. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to do that. Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, this morning just to examine our, our heart in our life. Isaiah spoke of us and said, they worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I pray that our hearts would not be far from you this morning. I pray that we would worship you um, in spirit and in truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Much for tuning in to the services of the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church. We wanted to tell you about our new app that you can go to the app store right now and find the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church app. And there on our app, you'll find all of our services there. You'll find all of our music specials. Also, we have podcasts. We have blog posts there. And uh, you can look up our coming events. You can sign up for events there. And it's a beautiful new application. We're very excited to tell you about it. And please go right now and download that app. God bless you. And we'll see you next time.